This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. How did we get into the position of trying to persuade city dwelling humans we still need nature? And how can we describe the speed at which life is disappearing? All that is in a stunning new report from the United Nations. Dr. Sandra Diaz is the lead author of this report that is taking the world by storm. It is the IPBES Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. That is where we discover ongoing human damage to other living things is as great a threat as climate change. The scientific work of Sandra Diaz is decorated with many awards. She is one of the most cited environmental scientists in the world with over 300 peer-reviewed papers. Diaz works from the University of Cordoba in Argentina, her home base. From Cordoba, Sandra Diaz, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hello. Pleasure to be talking to you. Yes, I'm really glad you could join us. Sandra, why should we be shocked by this massive new report coming from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services? Well, I think it's the very first time in which evidence coming from all areas, not just ecology, not just economy, not just sociology, converge into a clear and alarming picture that the extent of our domination of the Earth is, is getting to a really stretching point. Yes, it almost sounds like humans are driving towards a kind of agricultural planet where unnecessary, in quotes, life forms are driven out. What is so dangerous about that? It's very dangerous because we actually depend on the diversity of nature in all aspects of our lives, whether we realize it or not. Life on Earth is not just a menu in a cafeteria where you can just focus on the one or two things you fancy that a particular day and everything else will be left alone. Life on Earth is an intricate fabric, and we are one of these many threads intergoven in the fabrics. So if we start cutting threads, the whole fabric will unravel. And the analogy goes that if we cut the threads of the fabric that supports and interweaves us, our lifestyle will follow with it, with unraveled with it. So if you think that we have evolved for millions of years in deep interconnection with the fabric of life, if we start unraveling the fabric of life, our lives wouldn't, wouldn't be the same, physically, psychologically, and spiritually, without it. So in a planet without all the apparently unnecessary forms of life, as you put them, in that kind of planet, we would lose our life on Earth as we know it and as enjoy it. According to the new assessment, how much of the land environment has been severely altered to date by human actions? About 75%, that's three quarters of the surface of the land, and about two-thirds of the surface of the oceans have been severely altered. So basically now nature on Earth is human nature. That's a very frightening thought when we look at the current state of human politics and, and, and the way we act towards one another. If we act towards nature in the same way, we're not the government we should elect to, to run nature, I don't think. Well, whether we like it or not, we are running the planet now. We humans, collectively, are running the planet now because the parts of the planet which are completely independent of our doing is really small and getting smaller every day. So we basically need to face it and take full responsibility to be good stewards of the planet. And that's why they call it the Anthropocene, I suppose. How much of the loss of nature catalogued by your team comes from climate change compared to other factors like agriculture and business? If one looks at the last 50 years and if one looks at the whole planet, not particular places, climate change is not the most important direct driver of change. The most direct driver is land use and sea use change, followed by direct extraction of animals such as by fishing or plants such as by logging. Climate change actually comes third at the global scale. 
However, its impacts are clearly increasing in the, in the last few years. And all our business as usual scenarios for the next 30 years show very clearly an increasing impact of climate change. And not only that, we have a large number of examples that climate change and the other factors don't act separately, but they actually interact with each other, making each other worse. So, for example, when you add the pressures of climate change, say an increasing temperatures or droughts, to particular areas in where we already have big problems because of land use and we already have big problems because of pollution, then the, the problem becomes much worse. So, Sandra, is it fair to say that even if we did not have a problem with greenhouse gas emissions, the new IPBES report shows that nature would still be severely threatened to the danger point? Indeed. That's one of the major messages from our report. High greenhouse emissions are just one of the many symptoms of the unprecedented human domination of the planet. Over the past 50 years, our capacity to consume the fabric of life that supports us and our capacity to produce waste has increased massively, as you well pointed out. And all the forms of pollution, including greenhouse gas emissions, are just symptoms. The changes in climate, the extinctions we are seeing are all symptoms of the big global illness, if you want to use a clinical metaphor. How many species do scientists expect we will lose on our present course of development, and how can you arrive at any number? Okay, the numbers we arrive are estimation based on the best of biological sciences. There are a number of research groups and a number of dedicated organizations about, uh, around the world who do that full-time, trying to estimate how many species are on Earth, and on the basis of the threats faced by the species groups that we know well, they estimate what is the total threat. And the estimations, the best ones as showed in our report, are that around one million species of animals and plants are threatened. And the rate of extinction is at least tens to hundreds of times faster than has been on average in the past 10 million years. So it's really fast. And if we continue doing business as usual, we are likely to lose most of them very fast. But how many species indeed end up being extinct really depends on us. You mentioned the thread and the, and, and the fabric of which we are all part, and I picture a rather dark vision in which maybe as a last resort, scientists or industrials manage to make a careful ladder species we depend on right down to the biota in the soil, and then we confidently judge which other species we can go ahead and lose, which are disposable, as we go ahead and take over everything. But I think that's dangerous, maybe even impossible. What are your thoughts? I think, as I mentioned in the beginning of the conversation, it's a really, really dangerous path that assumes that we knew all the connections that species have with us and all the connections they have with each other. And that's extremely difficult in the fabric. And instead of trying to go to that really, really um, dangerous path, it would be much easier and much cheaper, certainly, try to keep them, because we can. The fact they are threatened, as I said, doesn't mean they are necessarily doomed. We can make an effort to save them. There are very successful examples. There are a number of species that would be extinct now if it wasn't by the efforts made by conservation organisms in the, in the past few years. There are a number of uh, ungulates, there are a number of birds that have been literally brought back from the brink of extinction. The panda, for example, is such an iconic one that I, everybody knows him. Uh, the panda has been downlisted now thanks to the great efforts to conserve it. So this all shows that when we apply will, 
when we really take a decision to do something for them, we can bring them back from the brink of extinction. We cannot bring them back from extinction itself, but we can bring them back from the brink and make a difference. And don't just wait for those uh, threats to actually realize themselves in, in, a, in, a, in a few years. In North America and in Europe, there have been tendencies to romanticize indigenous people as the true keepers of nature. But the upcoming report from IPBES shows this is really true in many parts of the world. Please talk to us about that. Well, one of the novelties of our report is that for the first time at the scale of global reports, we take a systematic approach to incorporating the knowledge and the issues of indigenous peoples and local communities. And one of the ways in which they enrich the report is we were able to assemble a really comprehensive collection of practices from indigenous peoples and local communities from around the world that actually enhance biodiversity. They have been responsible for the vast majority of the very many locally adapted varieties of animals and plants around the world. I'm talking about here domesticated varieties of crops, domesticated varieties of poultry, of um, livestock, etc. Indigenous peoples and local communities have been the, the stewards of all these varieties uh, around the world. They have been able to keep highly diverse traditional landscapes, many of which are so valuable that now are protected under the United Nations um, World Heritage Landscapes. And overall, it shows that they are doing, a, I mean, nobody's perfect, okay? But they are doing a better than average job as compared to the rest of people in keeping biodiversity. During a recent visit to New Zealand, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the political will to fight climate change has faded at the same time as it is getting worse for those feeling its effects. Is that true for biodiversity as well, do you think? Well, I want to believe it's not true for biodiversity. I would say quite the opposite. I would say we were positively surprised by the huge impact of our report. Of course, we are very proud of the report, and we were hoping for a big impact, but the, the repercussions we are having around the world completely took us first by surprise. And it means that people are probably for the first time listening that biodiversity is important. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. A new report from the United Nations warns nature is under threat by human activities of all kinds. Our guest is the lead author, Dr. Sandra Diaz. What are the big challenges to biodiversity in your own country of Argentina? Well, in Argentina, as in, in most of South America, the major threat is basically the fast expansion of industrial agriculture without any safeguards. This is having really, really high impact on biodiversity at all levels and also social impacts on people. Human expansion on Earth sometimes reminds me of algae in a pond. Algae can expand until it runs out of oxygen and then it crashes. Is there a crash point for humans uh, when it comes to biodiversity and are we nearing it? Well, <laughs> I think you put it beautifully. Uh, physics and biology clearly show that we cannot keep consuming indefinitely. It's just against the laws of physics. And we cannot keep dumping waste in, indefinitely either because it just doesn't go away. So definitely we are on collision course if we keep doing business like this. But again, how far from the brink we stop depends on us which I think is one of the most powerful messages from our report. We are not necessarily doomed. We can still push the brakes and, and, and change course. Does your assessment report find that the movement from endangered to extinct is speeding up? Is there a time factor in this? Yes, definitely. There are a number of uh, 
very solid calculations that shows that uh, the rate of extinction is speeding up fast, but also a number of case studies around the world show that movement in the opposite direction is also possible when we take action. As I mentioned, there are a number of animals that could have been extinct by now if, if we didn't take proper action. So the pace at which extinction happens is in our hands. That's a very important message because normally people look at extinctions of your geological times, and of course there's nothing that can be done about it. It just happens. But the extinction rates we are looking at now are completely human cost, which is lamentable, but at the same time, it gives us power over that rate. We can slow it down dramatically if we choose to. Well, I want to expand on something that you've said there, because yes, we can save perhaps the panda or the California condor, but it takes a lot of money and a, a tremendous effort for each species, and there are so many species at risk doesn't it seem like we really need to change our whole lifestyles and our and our whole consumption of nature to allow all those unseen things? I mean, there are beetles, there are biota in the soil, there's all sorts of things that are threatened that we don't know about and we can't save because we don't know about them. So don't we need a, a broader approach? Definitely. We need a broader and much deeper approach. The conservation measures with the panda or the Arabian ibex, etc., are successful, but in a way they are fixes for the symptoms of the illness. So imagine you, you jump from the roof and you broke every bone in your body and you're bleeding all over, etc. You need to do you need to do something about the symptoms. You need the urgent painkillers, things like that. You need a blood transfusion immediately, right? And all the conservation measures protecting this particular species or creating more natural parks, etc., are fixes to deal with the symptoms. Don't, don't take me wrong. They are incredibly important. We need them, right? And, and we need them because if we wait until we are dealing with the true causes, all these glamorous species will be gone and we don't want them to be gone. But to actually cure the patient, to fix those broken bones, to, to stop this bleeding, we need really deep uh, action. And that's why we talk about transformative change and we're talking about transforming the way we do eco the economy, transforming the way we do business, basically incorporating biodiversity considerations and biodiversity safeguards and safeguards for the natural world in all the sectors of uh, the economy and our normal, the, the ways people's lives are run and the, way, the ways countries are run. So it's quite a radical change to, to make, but this is what it takes. When it comes to land use loss, it seems the greatest threat in South America is meat production, and in Asia it is palm oil production. Surely we don't need to keep expanding either of those products until everything's gone. Indeed. Uh, they are having vastly negative consequences for nature and people. They are the major threat in the whole continent of South America, certainly in many areas in Africa, and certainly in some of the most diverse areas of the world. So while these activities keep expanding, the local population suffers the most of it, but also the whole planet suffers because this is where most of the species we have today exist. And these activities today are good business because they are not paying the true costs. And many people who benefit from them are in distant places, so they don't realize about the consequences of these choices. Most of the biodiversity, which is humans' common heritage, lies in these areas. So if they go, we all have a less rich, less wonderful world. Many people have, who use uh, soybean products or almond oil products on their everyday life don't realize the huge suffering that's behind them. 
I, I remember watching a documentary about orangutans with a member of my family, and she loved the orangutans and was very excited. And she likes beauty products a lot, and one of them is based on palm oil. So I, I took the opportunity to say, do you know, you know, your purchase of these particular products are doing to the orangutans you feel so you know, close to and you feel so moved by. And she looked at me in complete amazement. She had no idea. And I'm talking about a highly educated person. These kind of production systems are good business, first because they don't pay the true cost, and also because the consumers that could drive different choices actually are not fully aware of the consequences of their apparently harmless choices in their everyday lives. Yes, even the Netherlands was burning palm oil as a power source, uh, as a green power source, and now we know what's happened in Indonesia. It's it's definitely not that. And at the same time, during our lives, Sandra, we've seen the globalization of the economy, and there's widespread travel, and there's shipping all over the world. And with that comes invasive species. Are we also seeing a kind of globalization of the plant and insect world? Indeed. It's so widespread that we even have a name for it. Actually, we have two names for it. In plant ecology, we call it biotic homogenization. The fact that because our faring organisms around the world with us, intendedly sometimes as crops and as garden plants, and very often unintendedly just, just piggyback on our planes and our ships, etc., we are basically taking plants and animals to places that they would never reach otherwise. And that's why ecological communities all over the world tend to be more similar to each other. The same way that now you go to any shoppers, shopping center across the world and they all look the same. You don't know in what country of the world you are because they have basically the same stuff. We are doing the same with the biotic world. Please tell us about the Diversus Network. What is that? Okay. The Nucleo Diversus is a network of researchers and a think tank of people who do research on the areas of ecology, anthropology, and sociology in an interdisciplinary way, trying to produce primary science, but also trying to review and critically assess what uh, primary science produces and to put it closer to decision makers. We have a strong basis in Latin America and uh, the hub is in, is in my place. I, I am the director of Diversus, but we are also reaching internationally to a number of places in which we find researchers which share this uh, taste for interdisciplinary science. We've heard about the Paris Agreement and uh, the COP meetings uh, about climate change, but very few of my listeners have heard about the Aichi biodiversity targets. Can you briefly tell us what they are and how that relates to the new IPBES report? Okay. The Aichi targets were targets agreed by the, the countries who have signed the Convention on Biodiversity, on Biological Diversity. That's an intergovernmental body. So countries get together and agree on common visions and common targets in, in 10 years period. So the Aichi targets were uh, established in 2010, so 10 years ago, and as part of our, the mandate for our IBES report was that we should be making a critical assessment on whether the countries are likely to achieve the targets by 2020, that is basically tomorrow, right? So the targets are very general. Some of them have to be with, for example, increase the number, the surface of protected areas to X percentage of the earth, some have to do with curb the damage made by invasive species. Some of them have to be with increase the awareness of biodiversity through education. So they are very general and they cover very different aspects of uh, people's lives, 
all the way from quick fixes to deep changes. And what we found that of 20 of these targets, they are in total 20, we have done relatively good progress with only four of them. And these four of them are fixes, so to speak. They don't tackle the deep causes of biodiversity deterioration. So, for example, one of them is increase the percentage of the surface of the earth that is under formal protection, right? In that particular target, we done well. We have substantially increased the number of protected areas, at least in paper, but biodiversity keeps falling down. And that's why, because why we fix that, and again, I do emphasize that we need protected areas and we need better and more protected areas, but why we keep trying to deal with that symptoms, biodiversity is decreasing sharply in all, all these areas of the world which are not protected. At the launch of the IPBES report, you said the battle is not lost yet. Others on the same panel also said we still have time. What still gives you hope that we can save the nature we all depend on? Well, you know, many people may think that we are hopeless optimists, and maybe we are. But we are optimists because, first, because we don't have a choice. Yeah? We are either very fiercely optimist or we don't have a chance, right? So just keeping business as usual is not, is not an option. And I want to believe that humanity as a whole is smart enough to realize that. And the other thing that I think makes me, at least me personally, optimistic is that a few times before now, a few times in history, there were changes that, until they happened, looked basically impossible or extremely unlikely because they were so much against the grain, because they were so much not business as usual, because they were so much against a very, very large number of vested interests, and yet they happened. There was a tipping point at some point. People just decided it had to happen, and they did happen, and things did get better. And the fact that our report has got so much attention and there are all these environmental movements just cropping up all over the world, people just taking the streets because of nature, taking the streets because of climate, makes me think that we still have hope. Is there anything else from the new report you would like to communicate to our listeners as we finish up here? First of all, before I say to the Ulysses, let me congratulate you for the outstanding quality of your questions. Really insightful. So thank you so much for that. It's not every day that we have the excuse to, to reply to those kind of questions. <laughs> and a message to your listeners would be that a life without the connection with the great fabric of life is not the unavoidable cost of development, is not a natural state of things. And this statement is not a philosophical statement. It's a statement based on the best scientific evidence from many different fields of knowledge as reflected in our report. So being nurtured by a fabric of life that is good, healthy, and in good working order is actually not a luxury. It's your birthright. And I would encourage your listeners to fight for this birthright. We have been speaking with Dr. Sandra Diaz, one of Argentina's leading scientists and a world-recognized expert on biodiversity. We have an executive summary crammed with worrying facts from world scientists. I'll put links to that in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Sandra, thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with us. Okay, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.